We continue in our study of First John. We're going to be in chapter 4 today. First John chapter 4. And uh, we'll read 7 uh, through 21. This is what the Bible says. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever loves not does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God is revealed among us, that God has sent his Son, his one and only, into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God loves us this much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God at any time. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we live in him and he in us, that he has given us of his Holy Spirit. So we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. We have come to know and to believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who lives in love also lives in God, and God lives in him. By this, love is perfected in us, so that we may ha have confidence on the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear relates to punishment, and the one who fears is not yet perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, this one is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment that we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother. When I was a kid, there was one of those campfire songs that we used to hear, and it uh, was the King James Version put to music, to guitar music, so it was like uh, 70s contemporary and King James and campfire, and it was one of those kumbaya moments for me, so I memorized this as a child. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and he who loveth knoweth God, um, for God is love. And so you have all the ifs and the loveth and the beloved. And I was like, uh, when I was a kid, man, I loved that stuff. So I have fond memories of this passage, but it's also a central passage. The reason that it was put to music is it's a central passage in this book. And so what I want to do today is to look through the passage and sort of highlight what I think are some simple yet important spiritual truths. So the first is this, that God's perfect love is his 
defining characteristic. God's perfect love is his defining attribute. If you want to know what God is like, if you want to describe who God is, love is the thing that should be at the tip of the tongue. That's who God is. So lots of time, we like to just think of it as something that God has. God has great love for us because of his great mercy, because of his, his compassions that fail not, because of his love that endures forever. But what we hear in this passage twice is that God is, and that means equivalent to, love. Right? It's not a possession. It's his character. And that's an important thing to understand, that God is love in its perfect form. And so over the years, and if I lose you on this, I apologize. I have lost many people on this explanation. But I think that um, this is kind of the key place where we can understand the Trinity. And I think of this passage as, as revealing the Trinity as love. So when we talk about the Trinity as Christians, uh, we use different analogies because, to be honest, the Trinity blows our minds, right? To be honest, when we try to understand the Trinity, we have to use metaphors and examples and illustrations because when you start to really try to comprehend who the Trinity is, that there is one God revealed to us through scripture in three persons, we have like a mathematical crisis and we start frying brain cells. Those of you among us who are accountants, you get to the bottom of the line and it doesn't feel like it adds up and the smoke starts coming out the ears. So some have tried. Say it's like an egg, you know, there's a, a shell, there's a yolk, there's some white. Really, that's three different things, right? It's not a really good illustration. The early church called that a heresy. So that's three gods. They're just unified. So another one is uh, water. People say it's like ice. And then it could be like liquid water. And then it could be like water vapor. Then you have three that are really the same. But this is not three persons. This is just three modes of expression. So the early church said this is modalism, it's heresy. So whenever you try to describe the Trinity, and this was the thing that I loved to do when I was in a seminarian, is you basically are just on the edge of a cliff ready to fall into heresy. So I always like to play the part in Trinity where I'd get someone else to try to explain the Trinity, and then I would point out how they were a heretic. That was fun for me. But to actually try to do it myself, whew, that was risky business. But this passage reveals in ways that um, the, I see in part everywhere else in the scripture. It reveals when I understand God as love, I can understand the Trinity as love. So what I want to, to state which is what we believe as Orthodox Christians, is that God is one God in three persons, three persons who are co-existent, co-equal, and co-eternal. That's orthodoxy right there. That's about all you can usually say and still be safe. What I see throughout scripture, which is revealed in this passage, is that God the Father loves his son. And the son loves the Father. And the son loves the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit loves the son. And the Holy Spirit loves the Father. 
So somehow, when I look at the Trinity, I see the three persons, but in the three persons, I see a loving relationship, one person to the other, in, in, in such a way that I cannot extract a person of the Trinity from the love that they have for the other and the way that they are loved among each other. In the Trinity, there is no third wheel. Love is perfect. And so what I want to say, and here's where I'm really stepping out on faith, to all my seminarian friends who watch this on YouTube later, they can, they can correct me. But I think this is, this is really the, the truth of the Trinity right here, is that the relationship between the persons of the Trinity or among the persons of the Trinity is not able to be extracted from the persons that is love that is God God is both the persons and the relationship amongst the persons I think that's what the elder tells us here God at his core his defining characteristic is pure perfect love So, in this passage, we see that God is at his core character love. And that actually has some existential cash value for us, right? Why does all this theology matter? That's what I'm asking. It matters because it tells us this, that God is self-sufficient and self-satisfied. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. God is fulfilled in the love relationship that is God. This, this seems like, whoa, that's, is that good news? Is that the gospel you're preaching there? This is the gospel, right? God's love is not selfish. It does not need you. He doesn't need people to worship him. He deserves it, but he doesn't need it. Are we together? This is important because when God loves you, it's the expression of genuine love that comes out upon you, not because God has any need of you, but because he loves you anyway. So even though God is self-satisfied, even though God enjoys the love of the Trinity, his love is overflowing within him it does not fail it does not end and everything that we experience from God is the outpouring of this love when we are created in the image of God to have relationship with God that's an act of love we have life because God loves that which is not God you guys are getting theology today this is the truth. Creation, that God would knit you together in your mother's womb, that he would dream you up and know you before you were ever born. When from the foundations of the earth, he planned you, that is an expression of his love, and your life is an expression of the love of God. That he sustains you when you don't live up to that perfect plan. Every breath, every heartbeat, every good night's sleep, every bad night's sleep, every day that passes, every year that passes, everything that you receive from parents, employers, are gifts of God to sustain your life. That's love. That's why we say God is creator. That's why we say God is sustainer. But in this passage, the main way that God demonstrates his love, the way that God's love is manifested among us, the way that God's love is revealed to us is in a decisive act that God loved us so much that he sent his son, his one and only. Why? 
that we might have life through him. Why? To be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. The, the, the main way that God demonstrates his love for us is in the life of Jesus Christ that brings redemption to us. God's love is shown perfectly in the life of Jesus Christ. And because Jesus Christ reveals the love of God, we come to know in a deeper way what love is by looking at that. We realize by looking at Jesus Christ that his love for us is unmerited. We actually don't deserve it. that his love is unconditional, that it's not based on a pact or a promise. We learn from Jesus Christ that God's love is self-sacrificing, that it's not selfish, but it's giving of himself. We learn from Jesus Christ that his love endures suffering endures death, endures the grave. God's love is manifested in the love of Jesus Christ who lived the life that we were supposed to live and died the death that we were supposed to die in our place to atone for our sins. And he rose again on the third day to win redemption for our souls, to defeat death and the power of sin in our lives. The extent of God's self-sacrificing, unmerited, unconditional love is expressed through the cross of Jesus Christ. It is God's defining characteristic. And it has redemption for its end. Though we did not merit, though we did not deserve the love of God, he loves us without end. And the impact of that love is redemption in our lives so that we might be rescued and returned and reconciled with a father who loves us. So whether you're an amateur theologian like myself, I say amateur because I was trained as a biblical scholar, not trained as a theologian. We can understand kind of the beauty of the Trinity and how that shows perfect love. But experientially, we see that love in the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave it all for you. The second truth that I see from this passage is that God's perfect love, God's perfect love is Tested and true. Okay. Look at verse 26, if you would. We have come to know and have believed. I'll hold on to that word, have believed. The love which God has for us. So when we talk about believed, it's not just believing that there is a loving God out there. Not just like intellectually believing that God's character is love. But it's an issue of trusting that love. Uh, the word that I prefer to use there is the word depend. We have come to know and we depend on God's love for us. His love is 
dependable. We rely on it. That's what trusting God's love means. It's not like some intellectual enterprise like we just experienced in trying to understand who God is and that he's loving, but it goes beyond that. In a very practical way, our lives depend on the love of God. He has proven his love for us in that Jesus Christ came He suffered in every way that we had. He was one with us on this earth. He knew our trials, our tribulations, our troubles. He sympathizes with all our weaknesses, and yet he doggedly was determined to never sin, and he never gave in once, right? God demonstrates his love for us, like it is proven in this that Jesus, knowing the cost of your sin, died for it. He went up Calvary, that he saw those who had been killed there before, and he willingly went there to bleed for you, to cry for you, to call out in your place, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he would experience the isolation, the abandonment, the punishment, the wrath of God that you wouldn't have to do it. Layman's terms, he took the bullet for you. He stepped in the way. So he's proven it. But there's, there's another piece of that. It's not that we just profess our faith in Christ that we actually experience this love, right? So there's a confessional piece, we profess it. There's also an experiential piece. We know for a fact that God loves us because his spirit resides with us. This is, this is one of our evidences that we profess Christ. The other evidence that we have love in our life is that the spirit of God is within us correcting us, convicting us, propelling us forward, compelling us to love as God first loved us, right? Verse 13, this is how we know that we live in him and he in us because he has given of us his spirit, so we experience the love of God not just because of the historical truth that we profess that Jesus died in our place, but also because we know firsthand that the Spirit has come into our lives and is moving us forward. That's what it means to depend on him. We depend on his love. You know, as a father, as a friend, I'm not that great of a person. I err again and again by my own wit, right? Right? I have actually have selfish desires. I get tired. More often than I want to admit, I have a battle in my brain between the couch and the kitchen when I come home. Because I'd rather, every day I'd rather sit on the couch and wait. And my kids will testify that that happens from time to time. When... Love compels me to help clean up without shouting at people. To help cooking without putting a guilt trip on anyone. Without, like, checking the box on the balance scale so that she owes me one. I'm selfish. There are times I know the laundry get, needs to be done, and it's like, sometimes I think my wife struggles with this too, because it's, it's like a little competition. Who can hold out the longest, right? Somebody's got to wash the clothes, and you see the bin getting close to the top, and we're both having selfish weeks. I don't know if it's like, I'm just talking truth, man. I don't know if it's like this in your house. But it starts to go higher and higher, and it's like we're, the, long, the bigger it gets to, the bigger the job, the job is. But it's like, I know, man, I can outlast that woman, right? <laughs> Unless I run out of underwear, you know. 
That's the kicker. So one time, he was getting to the point where we were in trouble. Like, I knew I was going to run out before her, so I just went and bought more underwear. Man, this is, this is better than confession, right? So what I'm saying is when we live our everyday lives in the little things, there's so many things that we do out of selfish, unloving, uncaring level. Even sometimes the things that we, that we, we want to do, we do it because we get the kudos or the credit or we credit our account so the other person will have to do it the next time. So the fact that we have the Spirit in us means that the Spirit can compel us to overcome our incompetencies. The Spirit can push us to choose not ourselves and our sin, but to choose to serve, to love, to forgive, to keep no record of wrong. That's a good one. That's a hard one. Right? We don't do that naturally. We do that because we're compelled by the spirit that we experience within us. So, if we want to love like God first love us, we must, based on this, depend on his spirit to compel us, to empower us, to encourage us to act in loving ways. There is um, something wonderful about depending on the, the love of God instead of on our own merit or our, our own energy, or our own righteousness. If you keep going down from verse 16, uh, 17 says, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have, have confidence on the day of judgment because as he is, so we are in this world. So this love that we depend on gives us confidence on the day of judgment. In other words, we don't have to worry about the wrath of God that is coming our way. As he is, we are in this world means that uh, in the way that God viewed the life of Christ, God views our life. That's why we don't fear judgment because when God looks at your life, he doesn't look at all the terrible sinful things that you've done. Instead, he knows that you're covered by Christ and he looks at Christ's life. That's the, that's the regard that God has for us as he has for his only son. That's an amazing piece. As he was, we are in this world. It's not just regard though. It's also relational. The way that he related in the world is the way we relate in the world. So there's this piece that is a, a, a justification from God that we are regarded highly as God would regard his only son. But we also are to live in the world in relationship with others as Jesus related to others. So, there's that side too, which compels us even further to act like Christ. He is our proclamation and he is the standard for our practice. So here's the third thing as we get to that. God's perfect love. God's perfect love is what compels and provokes love in the church. It's God's perfect love in you that compels and provokes the kind of love that you need for the church. And so 
what the elder is really talking about here is how we love one another. So especially to the family of God, we are supposed to be in a right relationship with each other, loving one another. That's the command at the beginning of the passage. Beloved friends, let us love one another. Right? Verse 11. If God has loved us this much, we must love one another. Verse 12. No one has ever seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is completed or perfected in us. The final verse, verse 21. This is the command that we have from him, that the one who loves God must love his brother as well. So the love ethic, the command is clear that we rely on this dependable love of God in order to love one another. So as you start to think about how you respond to the scripture today, because what we mean by calling it our authority for life is that when the spirit uh, reveals something through scripture, we obey it. When we read scripture, we're not reading it like another book. We're reading it with the intent to obey Christ. So it is my expectation for you as it is for myself that when we read scripture, there's a life impact in us. Simple question is, what must I obey? So some of you, as you start thinking about this, maybe um, thinking about, have I ever experienced this love? Am I in a real relationship with God? Others of you may be at a point where um, I have not been obedient to love others. I have not uh, had the love in myself to be diligent with my faith. First John has... um, I think this is pretty harsh. So I hope that it hits you the way it smacked me in the face. I think it's important that we hear this. Right at the end, verse 20. If someone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, what is he? A liar. Anyone who does not love his brother who he can see cannot love God who he does not see, right? I just want that to smack you in the face like it smacked me in the face. Because when I think about it, I am, my false love indicates that I have false faith. My failure to love indicates that I have a failure of faith. Do do you hear what I'm saying here? Like, it's almost like a litmus test. If you don't love like you are loved by God, then your faith is deceptive. Don't deceive yourselves. God's perfect love in you is always expressed outwardly. So what we've learned today is that the source of perfect love is in God. The expression of God's perfect love is in the cross. The result of God's perfect love is your redemption. And the completion of God's perfect love is our proclamation or the reconciliation of a lost world with a God who loves them. How much, brothers and sisters, do you have to hate someone to know about salvation and not share it with someone who is dying and going to hell? This is a legitimate question, one I ask myself. I don't think of it in that, those terms. You know, if it was a building on fire and I saw people in the lobby and they were dying, I would, I would shout, you know, the smoke's coming, the fire's coming, just get out. You know, I, I, I think in those moments where it was really obvious 
when there was a, a kind of urgency that I know that I, I just know in myself that I would respond and I'd let people know your house is on fire. I wouldn't just watch it burn and watch the kids and the pets and the parents die in the house, right? How much would I hate them to watch them burn? Like even someone I don't like on my street, I picture that there's something good in me something loving in me that if they were really at risk for something catastrophic like that, (laughs) that I would just do something. You're good people. Don't you think? If, If you saw the train coming and children were playing on the tracks that you would alert them? That you would warn them? How hateful would you have to be at a heart level to sit there and watch it plow through them? We would call you a psychopath, wouldn't we? I I know there's a risk here that I'm overstating something, but I actually don't think that I am based on this scripture. Like my goal is, is not to to make you feel guilty. My goal is not to accuse you of anything, but I want the scripture to wake you up and let you realize what this means. If we know someone is not right with God, if someone's living an unredeemed life, how can I have confidence to just let them know? Let them know that the disaster is coming, that the wrath is coming, that the fire is burning, that the train is on its way. See, because the scripture tells me here that in Christ I have confidence for the coming day of judgment. Verse 18 is beautiful here for me. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. I imagine on those little examples that I gave you, that I would have the boldness, the courage, that I would not be afraid to speak up, to shout out. Even in some situations, I can envision myself running into a burning building or pushing children out of a train's way. Like, I think I would have in that moment the boldness and the confidence. So what the Bible says right here is whoever is afraid, whoever fears love is not yet perfected in him love is not yet perfect in her you see because the completion of God's love when it comes to its end is about reconciling reconciling a world to their father God love's source is God Love's expression is Christ. Love's result in our life is redemption. And love's completion or perfection is in a proclamation that will reconcile a lost world with a God who loves them. So now we're coming to a time of responding to scripture because I think there's something to obey in here. So if you happen to be one of those people who say, no, look, I I don't have a relationship with a God who who loves. I don't even understand how love works. I don't feel like I've ever been loved. I don't have a relationship with a God who who will restore my soul. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. As we close today with song, I want you to pray a prayer of conversion. Lord, I've been living for myself. I've been living in sin. I want to repent from all of that and I want to follow your son, Jesus Christ. I commit today to live for you for the rest of my life.
to make you recognize you as the Lord of my life. Let that be your prayer as we close today. There's some of you, for whatever reason, have been living in fear, anxiety, have not been expressing love in appropriate ways. Not just among the body of believers, the children of God, but even among your neighbors, your relatives, your friends. The Spirit has convicted you today, and I don't want you to ignore the Holy Spirit. What I want you to do is, in our time of reflection as we sing our last song, I I pray that you confess that sin, to turn from that wicked way, to turn from that hateful way. Commit today to live out love. This is not something that I'm trying to make you feel bad about yourself. If you're enslaved to anxiety and fear and you don't have confidence to proclaim your faith faith, and you don't have confidence for the day of judgment, I ask, I, the prayer is to be delivered from that. Right? Turn, turn away from that. Ask for, ask for the Lord to, to deliver you from fear. There is no fear. Perfect love drives fear out. Perfect love casts anxiety far away. Perfect love doesn't worry about how you look when you're, you're running down the street and shouting, there's trouble coming. And finally, as we close in song, let's consider how we might perfect the love of God in our community. Especially to the body of believers, let us love one another without end. And let that love overflow into this world around us where we are positioned in this community. Beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever loves not does not know God for God is love. Beloved, let us love one another.